Welcome to The Law, Your Money, and You. I'm Roberta Sapphire, an attorney in Sharon, Massachusetts. And I'm Camille Barron, a financial coordinator, also in Sharon, Massachusetts. And today we're going to be talking about an interesting combination of topics. We've had people talking about financial matters, and we've had people talking about energy savings and the environment. We're actually going to be combining those two things today. Yes, it's very exciting, especially with more and more talk of global warming and deregulation and all that stuff. But I want to welcome, we want to welcome David Abelman. He also happens to be a Sharon. But David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Dave Abelman lived here in Sharon since 1998. And uh, I've had a passion for the environment since the first Earth Day. In fact, my sister won an award back in the 70s when the first Earth Day came about. So I've always been ecologically minded, but not as much of an activist as I've become in the last couple of years. I now look at myself, really since my background is engineering, I look at the world from an engineer's fact-based scientific perspective, and I've taken that avenue and dived, I've dived into the environmental piece also, with my background in finance and understanding businesses, I look at things now and consider myself to be very much an ecological financial advisor, which really means that I'm helping people understand the financial impact to them of making good ecological decisions that actually are good in their pocketbook and good for the environment. And we don't usually think of those two as no. going hand in hand. No. We usually think of it's an either or. Correct. When you, when you say ecological, too, look, I said the word. <laughs> I said it right. But anyway, you're talking about not just pollution in the year, but no. global warming. You're thinking Correct. of a, making uh, smart choices of uh, electricity, uh, water, uh, and all that stuff. Correct. Uh, getting away from the fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Well, fossil fuels are fuels that have been created by fossils, by dinosaur fossils, or I shouldn't say really dinosaurs, it's more the plant life oh. that was around for millions of years, and when the plants decomposed, they broke down into their basic um, chemical structure, and that's where petroleum and coal come yeah. from. Those are your dominant fossil fuels, oil. as well as gas. Oh, gas, which we're... Natural gas is also a derivative of fossil fuels. The United States is supposedly trying Correct. to get away from the dependency of the, those and just get by with our electric and our air and Renewables water. where it's Renewables. at. Renewables. Renewable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you, can you be more elaborate on renewable, renewable in terms of using it as a term as we do now with energy? Sure. What exactly would, would we be talking about? What does it mean as, as renewable? Well, renewable are things like water. There's a water cycle, so the rivers flow, and you can use the water on a renewing basis. Mm -hmm. Wind, that's renewable. It's mm -hmm. not being used up. Solar, that's renewable. There's also places where you can use heat from the underlying suck structure of the ground, thermo, geothermal. Mm -hmm. There's biomass that can be, when, you, when we're getting rid of garbage, that can be turned into reusing it, mm -hmm. and that can be turned mm -hmm. into, again, a reusable source of energy. So it sounds like um, one of the things that, that constitutes renewable energy, it either doesn't deplete a resource, Correct. or if it does deplete a resource, it, it replaces, in a sense, it, it renews or replaces that which it depleted. It's a good way to look at it. The key word that people are using is sustainable. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. the big challenge, because oil We've known since the 70s, it's not sustainable. We're going to run out eventually. Mm -hmm. Of course, back in the 70s, they predicted we were going to run out in 2020. Well, of course, the, the problem with the oil isn't just that we're going to run out. It's the dependency. Absolutely. That's Middle a Eastern separate re but related factor. Yes. They're all intertwined. Sure. It's a dangerous situation to be in. It, it, it is, and it can be, especially mm -hmm. if you understand economics and you understand how politics intertwines with following the money and how people are... Mm. Using the oil world, it, it's a, that's another conversation. It's another whole story. It's another <laughs> whole long conversation. Yeah, that one can be. So, so tell us now about deregulation and and what is deregulation? The deregulation of what? So deregulation means that typically the government will step in because there's a monopoly that's being formed, which means that there's inherent practices a big organization can force to charge more than is necessary. 
And so the telcos back with AT&T, that was deregulated. Yeah, the whole telephone. That's why you've got all these different uh, telephone companies. Correct. And that allowed people to now walk around with cell phones that instead of yeah. costing several thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and a thousand dollars a month for just local coverage back in the early 80s, now you yeah. have these things that are virtually free. Mm -hmm. And you pay a yeah. hundred bucks a month for a family plan, and you get tremendous coverage and data. It, it's, it's amazing, and that's a lot due to deregulation and competition. Mm -hmm. So, in part, the government stepped in, yeah. and in part, the energy companies. This is not known by most. Actually, wanted this yeah. deregulation of, of energy, specifically electric and natural gas to an extent, occurred because there's a monopoly of people who own the lines mm -hmm. to your houses. Mm -hmm. And so since I own the lines to your house and I'm the delivery agent of the energy to you, nobody else can compete. You're not going to have 500 lines coming to your house to deliver energy. Right. So you have to get the energy to your house from the utility. Well, in the past, the utility also was a producer of energy. So they owned the production facilities, the coal-fired plants, <laughs> nuclear facilities, wind farms in some cases, and everything all the different sources of energy that were created. Well, the government stepped in, again, in part because these monopolies were too big and abusive in some cases, but also because the utilities themselves found themselves saddled with old facilities that were costing them an arm and a leg, and they kind of wanted to get out of the production end of it. They wanted that monkey off their back. So the government stepped in and said, energy company, you're the company of record for delivering the energy, for billing, for service, for maintenance, for reading the meters. You get your energy from the grid, which is the common term for the lines that feed in. Mm -hmm. And the suppliers to the grid are now separated out as independent organizations separate from the utilities. So they deregulated the suppliers? It's still in progress. Oh, Fourteen okay. states have been deregulated for electric and gas in various flavors. Another 20 are in the process of becoming more deregulated. Eventually, all 50 are going to be because it increases competition. Well, they've been deregulated for quite some time, Correct. hasn't it? But so many people don't know it. It was passed in Massachusetts in 98. Now, um, on, on the de deregulated, um, the, the companies, uh, and I forgot what I was going to ask, so just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so, but, it, but again, the, the deregulation mm -hmm. occurred, and, and the government currently does not allow the utilities to make a profit on the supply side. So while they are still supplying energy to you, mm -hmm. they're not allowed to make money on it, mm -hmm. which means two things. Number one, they don't really care how much it costs because they're not incented to negotiate steep really? discounts on your behalf. So they don't, it's a pass-through. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, and here's the biggest monkey on their back, they have to actually outlay millions and millions of dollars up front. Cash flow, think about it. Not invested, they're outlaying it to pre-purchase vast amounts of guaranteed energy from the different suppliers. Because they have to ensure at the end of the day they're able to deliver to the demand. Well, where did they get it before? The same supply, different supplies. They before? get it the same places. That hasn't changed. The fact is, they can no longer make a profit on it. Isn't that interesting? You, you know, you know, it's funny. Our gas company. We just mm -hmm. got a notice from them, and it, it is probably the same. That mm -hmm. from now on, they will not service any of the equipment that they mm -hmm. rent. And in fact, they don't own it anymore. They sold it to another company. So, so I can see it's coming for the gas, and yes. and I remember what I was going to ask before, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> which a lot of people are really going to be in a shock if they take out their electric bill. Yeah. I bet no one understands the electric bill. Most people don't. So you you work for a company that's green, and yes. and and tell us what you mean by green. What do they mean by green? Because everybody wants to be green. They're saying, oh, green, go green. We have a furniture sale. We're a green company. Well, it's interesting because green to a lot of people means this. In fact, to businesses, it means oh. green as well. Mm -hmm. This. Um, let me go back one quick second. Since 99, Massachusetts, or 98, Massachusetts has been deregulated. Most residents have no clue that they can take advantage of that deregulation. 
more than 80% of the biggest businesses have already taken advantage of it for this reason, because they figured out I could save money on it. Bring in the green. The organization that I represent has actually one of several that has brought out green energy. The problem with most green energy is it's more expensive. And the brilliance of some people is that you can provide energy that's both green and competitively priced, and nobody knows they can take advantage of that. Okay, now what's green energy? So green energy is the renewables. renewables. So when you're purchasing energy from the green suppliers, if you will, those who are generating their energy using water or wind or solar, there are a number of providers. And there's other sources, but those are the dominant. In fact, wind is growing leaps and bounds. Even in the Northeast? Well, hugely in the Northeast. They call Chicago the windy city for political reasons, but Boston yes. is actually a windier city. Really? And very well situated to take advantage wind? of wind. Massachusetts is doing some phenomenal things in terms of wind energy that's actually going to enable the cost of wind to rival the cost of coal by 2016. Mm -hmm. For example, right now if you take a look at the towers out there, the wind turbines, they're not all that tall. They're a little hundred feet taller, mm -hmm. or what have you. Mm -hmm. The new technology that's created here in Massachusetts will actually enable them to be 400 feet tall. That does two things. Number one, it makes the blades bigger so that you can get a lot more power generated because it's bigger. But more importantly, when you build it taller, you're not dealing with fluctuating winds at ground level. You're dealing with higher speed, faster moving laminar or steady state, steady flow wind. So it's constantly spitting at a higher speed and you're generating much more energy. That's going to help drive down the cost of wind. And that's why organizations, I shouldn't say organizations, I should say financial moguls like mm. Warren Buffett, who stated the deregulation of energy will be the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Well, I've heard that before, yes. too. So he is heavily invested in green energy. He's got all kind of money dumped into wind farms, as does Bill Gates. I, I heard that the wind was better in the Midwest for, for wind energy than in the Northeast. That's why I was surprised that you said that. But There's good reasons why it has been. First of all, they're open fields. And again, the towers haven't been so tall. So that allows you to build out of sight large wind farms that aren't an eyesore and you're not going to get complaints, complaints from the neighbors. That's funny. Wind farms. So what are there? Uh, a bunch of, of uh, tall sure. churning things? There are places in the country that there's just wind turbines. You may have seen fields of solar panels. There are places that have fields, they call them wind farms, Fascinating. of turbines. Now, here's something most people don't know about these turbines. Have you ever driven by one of those windmills yeah. that's not spinning? Yes. Why did you think it wasn't spinning? Well, the first thing you would think is no wind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was, yeah, no wind. I was thinking maybe it was just a fake, you know, just a, <laughs> <laughs> like it's a landmark or something. <laughs> there must be another reason. I don't know. Why? Well, Why my first spinning? thought when I saw it was something's wrong. It's broken. It needs maintenance. That was my first conclusion. Oh. Yeah. But I found out. He thinks better than we do. Well, it doesn't. Uh. <laughs> I found out it's because there's not enough demand. So why should the producer of energy have his windmill spinning and giving energy away for free when he can't sell it because there's not enough demand? Oh. Well, really? would it spin anyway on its own? Not if you turn it off. Well, oh. uh, uh, where does the demand have to come from? It I has to consumer. come from the people. The consumers have to demand more green energy. So if I want to demand energy, help. how am I going to do it? Where do I go? Who do, do I, who like do I not on? Like green company? Well, that's one of them. Mm. Um, there are 20-some companies in Massachusetts that offer energy as an alternative to the utilities. It's still Funny. delivered by the utility. It's still billed by the utility. But you have to contact the third party company in order to get that type of energy. You have to go through them. NSTAR's website lists these certified organizations. National Grid lists them as well. So you, you can go online and look at the list of companies. Some are green and some oh, aren't. Some offer variations of mm -hmm. it. One organization right now is offering a green 100% wind-backed power that's roughly half the cost of what NSTAR and National Grid are charging for 100% wind power. In both cases, that energy is, is, is produced locally. Mm -hmm. NSTAR and National Grid are 
through um, some programs making sure that they're buying on behalf of their residents mm -hmm. and businesses mm -hmm. energy through the local towns and and, and th there's a um, it's a complicated piece when you get what's called energy certificates renewable energy certificates so let me talk on that briefly and then we'll move on um, a renewable energy certificate means that if I'm a producer of green energy I have a wind farm and I generate that energy I then produce a megawatt and I get a credit from the utility that says that I've generated a megawatt of green energy I can now take that certificate and sell it to anybody on the open market so if there's more demand it changes the supply and demand dynamics and the pricing structure of that energy. Mm -hmm. Some of those certificates are purchased from wind farms in the Midwest. So some companies can buy wind that's produced in the Midwest and sell it via a certificate here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Other companies, and NSTAR and National Grid, I believe, are focused on making sure that they're doing it locally because mm -hmm. that's their local business. Mm -hmm. They are buying not energy that's produced remotely, but energy that's produced in a certain geography that's local to them. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody uh, get, like, it's deregulated, and, and, and like I say, I bet people still don't know how to read their electric bill. They, they don't, in fact, a lot of people don't know that they're already paying a portion of their bill for a tax, actually, on helping build greener energy, renewable energy. It's already in there. Massachusetts has a state requirement for the utilities to deliver green energy that is 8% from renewables. Some companies are delivering 100% or 28% green. Some of them are brown energy, which is another term for oil, oil. gas, coal, fired plants, now, now, like the one in Brighton. We're getting closer. I wanted to bring up um, you, you, you yourself, you work for <clears throat> Viridian, that's another company, you know, it's, that. It's, a, it's a green and they're really going green. But what interests me and you two was you're riding around in a little motor scooter, a motorcycle, an electric, a, a, bike. Electri an electric bike. I, I want to talk about electric bikes sure. because that's, that's it. Now, we had a few years ago, there was somebody at the fair, uh, at an energy fair, and he had an electric car. Yeah. And this was unheard of, an electric car. And you've got the hybrids, and th that's really not the answer, the hybrids, because um, I have a hybrid. But that little bike, well, it's not that little, but but tell us about it. Like, how many miles does it get to? It kind of, this must be the, the way to the future, the electric bike. You've got to crank it up like I they know, did in 1914. I crank it up, I plug it in. It Where could, do you plug it? It can go in any outlet. Any outlet? Any standard outlet. It's not like cars have specific devices to plug them in, I can plug this into my house. Well, what about, does it have a three-prong yeah. or a two-prong? A three-prong. And, and how long does it take to charge? I mean, this is interesting. I mean, you, we've got all these teenagers that want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, a full charge on this bike takes six hours. I typically just plug it in at the end of the day and let it charge up overnight. It's not something I'm going to take to Boston. It's not something I'm going to take on a long trip. The, at max, this particular bike can only get about 60 miles. Mm -hmm. So um, it's more of a local? It's yeah. very much of a local. Yeah. In fact, uh, the, the most amazing thing to me is in addition to it being incredibly quiet, it's got no moving parts because if you understand how energy works when you put energy through a coil, that's what's happening. The rear wheel is the engine. There's no gears. There's no uh, chain. You put the energy from the battery into the coil in the rear tire, and it spins the rear tire. Oh. Now, now what... Um, <coughs> Maybe you should bring a picture in, and, and maybe we can put it on part of our we video. We should have the well, picture of us on the motorcycle. Yeah, sure. yeah I'll, I'll send Patrick a, nice a picture, picture that we took. of us. I want but we didn't, we didn't get a ride, though. Don't, don't anybody think that we got a ride. We well, the reason we didn't get a ride is because as much as I appreciate that it's quiet, because that's one of the things I don't particularly like about motorcycles is the noise, I'm still afraid to ride on them, okay. even if it's quiet. Oh, I, I, <laughs> maybe someday. My, my, my oldest brother, he was a, a bikey when bikies were bad to yep. be a bikey. But anyway, <laughs> You but, don't look but, like... Uh, but I'm a, no. Camille has no. something. We have a segment called You've Got to Be Kidding. She's got something 
for that. But I have, I have this. This is almost. This is like a transition, because after I saw that bike, and this is very interesting for people who are thinking of getting a bike, and what happens if you lose the cord and and all that. And you right. you can go in a cross country, and I don't even know if you know about it, but I looked it up, and you can say you've got to be kidding. <laughs> <coughs> there are, for your cars, for your bikes, for any of that, they have charging stations. Yes. There are charging stations, yes. and I'm not the expert, you are, but, but, there are, but you led me to believe, to look this up, I was so interested in it. Yes. There are charging stations throughout the whole country, not just in the northeast, not the, charging yeah, stations, yeah. 6,331 st charging stations, public stations charging stations and there are also I don't know how many private charging stations but imagine the reliance on an automobile as we know it using gasoline I bet you they really don't even need these cars with gasoline that they all could have been electric years ago well for short trips yes so you've got to be kidding, but, gotta be kidding. No. Yeah. But, but part of the problem is the economics of it producing an electric car is more expensive in fact, what some people don't understand is even by getting an electric car, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes costs and not necessarily good from an environmental perspective. Really? Yes. In terms of producing these batteries, oh, the oh, life cycle oh, of the battery that oh. has to be thrown away, yeah. and what it takes to produce that, which is energy consuming oh, just in the production energy. cycle. So it's not quite as uh, clear and clean as, as people have been led to believe. There's I some see. misinformation. But, but can you imagine, instead of stopping at a gas station, or maybe maybe they are, I've never seen, have you seen a charging uh, I station? I have. Uh, there's there's yeah. one down at Robert, Robert, uh, um, the school in Rhode Island. Um, I forget the name. There's a Rocky. Robert Williams. Uh, oh, Roger Williams. Roger, Roger Williams. Williams. I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking Robin Williams, right? Yes, Roger, Roger Williams. Williams. Roger Cousin Williams. <laughs> Robert, yeah. Roger Williams has a public charging station, but that's not something you can plug in a three-prong outlet. Mm -hmm. I have also just saw one over at the Big Y right off of Route 1. Uh -huh. There's a charging station and a little place for electric cars Do they cars charge only. you to charge? <laughs> uh, they do. They do. What, well, like, what, what is it? I it's don't know like how much it costs. Fill up your ear? Uh, fill up your I don't have an electric car yet, so I don't know. But what about the, oh, you do that at home, though. I do that the, at home. The bike. You know, my question is, we, and we started off in the beginning of, the, of this uh, show about the economics of it. Yes. And, of course, we know that it's kind of been a struggle in, in this country to get moving over to yes. this. Yes. So my question is, do you see that now the momentum is growing towards this and maybe we'll see less resistance? Or do you think we're still going to have a struggle with this? Um, people are resistant to change, but it's just like cell phones. Some people don't get a cell phone right away. It takes them 10 years. Mm -hmm. Deregulation has been available to the public for 14 years, and mm -hmm. not everybody's taken advantage of it. Maybe 12, 13 percent of Massachusetts residents mm. have chosen a third party because they don't know they can choose it. It costs nothing. It takes five minutes to do it. There's no gotchas if you understand it. I did it, it a year ago. You did? did. Yeah. You've got to yeah. be kidding. Well, actu actually, we did it when it first came out. The right. business did it when it first came yeah. out. And I wonder yeah, if some of that, right some of that is because of lack of education. About Mostly it. lack of education. A lot of it has to do with people don't trust in today's society. Right. And a lot of people don't have the time to do the due diligence. Exactly. To, and they don't want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It ain't broke. I ain't going to fix it. Right. But again, it's like a fast pass. But it is broke. People adopted <laughs> it. It yes. took 10 years. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like cell phones. It took a few years. Everybody's adopted it. At some point, we'll see it. In Texas, the government now mandates, if you do not pick, as a resident, a third-party utility company, the government throws your name into a lottery, and they will decide for you which of the third-party companies you oh, will really? use oh, because they're completely deregulated out. Eighty percent of the residents, by the way, in Texas have chosen a third party. Yeah. So they want to make it the rest of the next 20 percent. Mm -hmm. so well, that it's the better. It's better for them. It's better for the environment. Mm -hmm. it's and it's better for the utilities. They want that monkey completely off their backs. So yeah, they're pushing that, for it, absolutely. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're going to see that in Massachusetts. There's mm -hmm. been an accelerated pace of change. There's a lot of education, a lot more comfort, a lot more discussion around, around the topics. And what people, people are inherently lazy, 
So what I like to educate people on is how they can be lazy environmentalists. Doesn't take you any energy, doesn't right. take you any time, doesn't cost you any money, and you can have a big impact. Mm -hmm. um, one of the impacts that, that people don't understand is just by being 28% green, it's like recycling 12,000 two-liter plastic bottles, which is more than the next 10, 15 years of recycling that you would do. Really? Conversely, if you went 100% green, eliminated your carbon footprint, it translates into keeping about 700 gallons of gasoline from being burned. Really? Which is equivalent to one car. Wow. So if one household went 100% green, they would just take the pollution from one car completely out of the atmosphere. Excellent. That's major. That is major. So these are the little impacts that people can have mm -hmm. to be personal, acting personally, mm -hmm. but en masse, collectively, having a huge, huge impact on the environment. That's, That's fascinating. fascinating. That is really fascinating. Well, now we're really going to go to you've got to be kidding. Well, you know, this is something that we, we talked about before. That's we why his dad gets a lot of weird. Can you see? Yeah, I you see. You've got to be kidding. I like that. Yeah. Before, before we started the, uh, the tapes rolling, if you will, you had mentioned, and I thought this was something that we really should mention to the audience, yeah. uh, there's yeah, actually a new country yes. in this world, a new well, country on the planet. Country, Can you tell us about that? Country yeah. is, is a, it's an interesting term in this regard. Mm -hmm. The United Nations, a couple months ago, un unknown to many people, designated a new country. <laughs> <laughs> that country is actually called Garbage Patch. You've got to be kidding. I like that segue. That was good. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Look it up online. What they dis determined, uh, 2009, they discovered that there was large amounts of plastic floating in the Pacific. They determined that there's a vortex of the currents in the Pacific that causes that swirling motion of the waters to actually keep that plastic floating in a circle. It doesn't dissipate, doesn't go out. And that plastic, microscopic in many cases, is now expanded to an area greater than twice the size of Texas. Wow, that is called kidding. the Great Garbage Patch. Mm -hmm. We wish they you have, were kidding. I wish I were too. But that pl floating cesspool of plastic, they found that that's happening in all the oceans. The, the currents are swirling, there's a vortex, and the plastics don't biodegrade. In some cases, they break up into smaller particles, but they're now floating, they're getting into the fish, they're getting into the food systems. Uh -huh. And so to bring attention to this, the United Nations designated this new country, if you will, wow. called Garbage Patch. And, and with that... With that pleasant note, <laughs> <laughs> we do have to call we it a wrap. Call. <laughs> We're close. So Thank you on so such much. A sour note. Yeah. This has been very enlightening. Uh, uh, there's so much more that we probably could have yeah. talked about, and when we these things have happen, we, we always invite you to come back. Okay. And we'd love to do that. I would love. Yeah. As you can see, we're also very interested in what you had to say. Yeah. So listen, folks, if you are interested in finding out more about sustainable energy and any of the topics we talked about, please send us an email, and we'll be happy to get you in touch with Dave and provide more information. And anything else that you'd like to know about this or any other topic related to law or finance, let us hear from you. Because remember, this is your show, The Law, Your Money, and, and You. you.